I audible? Can anybody hear me? Okay, great, excellent. Uh, this is the story of my life. Uh, when I was very young, I was a huge fan of Superman and all the other <coughs> comic heroes, uh, uh, comic super superheroes who were around. And I actually loved wearing towels and jumping <coughs> off sofas, tables, and increasingly higher objects, uh, hoping that I could fly. That hasn't changed. I, I still hope that someday I'll be able to fly. I'm going to talk today about I can get this to work, uh, about social, um, why, it's serious, uh, why it's serious business. All the images that I'm, looking, uh, that I'm going to use in here are my wallpapers. And these wallpapers have been discovered at different times, uh, typically on Reddit. And if you guys aren't on Reddit, please get on Reddit. It's a, it's, a, it's a great place to be, great place to find stuff. The only problem is I don't know who's come up with those images because, you know, but I'm using them anyway. Uh, I want to focus on the big picture. And the way I see it, uh, the big picture is that audiences are consuming content differently. I touched upon it yesterday when we were sort of sitting up here, but I spent around 10 years in journalism. And I was part of a newspaper and a TV channel at a time when everybody in there was trying to figure out how to get younger people to read, uh, read their newspapers or watch, watch their news channels, etc. Uh, because younger people weren't reading newspapers any longer. And they, and increasingly, if you look at all the IRS numbers or whatever stats you want to use over the last 10 odd years, 15 years, the, num the amount of time spent reading a newspaper or watching news television has fallen dramatically. So does that mean that people aren't sort of getting access to news? No, it just means that they're getting access to their content differently. And I think this is the basis of almost all the activity that you see around digital and social and new media and all of these other terms that we keep coming up with. But this is a simple truth. If we assume that this is a the truth, then so my entire, well, at least the last four years of my life have been based on this being true. Uh, if it turns out to be wrong, let me know. So the journey so far, as far as online is concerned, right? So if you think back to the mid to late 90s, when the internet was first introduced in India, and mid 90s in most other parts of the world, early to mid, uh, mid 90s in most other parts of the world, when you went online, you would typically go via Yahoo, okay, and you'd find websites by going through the directory, in some way or the other. The directory was typically managed by a bunch of people. Uh, if you had your own presence, it would be on a place like GeoCities, and I'm and I'm sure there are people in here who remember BBSs, but I'm not going to go back that far. But typically, you'd have a very scary-looking GeoCities page, as many bright colors as possible, some images moving around if you could find them. And the only way to sort of advertise online was using display ads on Yahoo or Rediff, and Rediff has been around for ages now. That changed to when you started to have search. So Google changed a lot of things. Uh, so now you went to Google and you searched for something that you wanted to find. That also changed the way that websites got made. So most corporate websites earlier were just translations of their brochures, and then they started to become these. They started to have forms of some sort or the other, perhaps a search bar, certainly a contact form, so you could sort of send, a, send an email. And you started to see a lot of search ads. But what's most interesting is uh, protocols. How many of you were on chat? Uh, just raise your hands. MSN and ICQ and Yahoo. And you remember that once upon a time when you were on one. You couldn't sort of talk to people who were on Yahoo, right? So if you you had three or four chat windows open at the same time because you need to talk to all your friends and all of the others, and then one day suddenly they would all start talking to each other. What changed was something called XMPP, which is a protocol, which basically was a sort of language that everybody agreed that we can talk to each other using this language. And a lot of what I call Web 1.0 was all about building if websites are islands. And you sort of spent a lot of time building bridges between them. You know, content was sort of siloed, resources were siloed, people were siloed, right? And you went online to look for information. In the last five years, that's changed. So we discover content today. I typically find new websites uh, or news articles using a service like Twitter or Reddit or StumbleUpon or some other social aggregation news gathering service. I sort of don't go to Google for stuff. Uh, always, and most of us don't. Facebook is becoming the home page for many of us, our first photo call when we sort of switch on our computer. Um, instead of search ads, you're seeing a shift in spend to social ads. And instead of protocols, we move into APIs. 
And I want to spend some time on that, but not right now. So I'll come back to it, yes. But an API is, if you think about it, it's like having a bunch of switches that are available to your plugs and switches, and you can sort of plug in and get information and let information flow back and forth. Right? So we will sort of spend some time on that. But that's the journey so far. So this is where we are today. So Web 1.0 was all about protocols, right? So a bunch of, bunch of acronyms which mean, mean very little to most of us sitting in this room. But one of my personal heroes, and I'm sure he's a hero for a lot of us, I love this slide that Steve Jobs has used multiple times. It's, it's, two, it's road signs, and it says, and you know, he kept making this point that we stand at the intersection of technology and liberal arts. I'm very lucky. I've spent 10 years in journalism and around 10 years writing code. And somehow, that's brought me to this intersection. So I, I, I love the underpinnings of all the, code, uh, all the code that you see floating around, and I love communication. So, so the two have sort of come together for me. So I, I wanted to define social differently. I don't think social is Facebook and social is Twitter, sure there aspects of it, but what is social? Uh, I think it's these three things. It's evolution, it's participation, and it's integration. And I think drill down each one of them. So this is a belief, I could be wrong, but I know that social is changing societal values. And when I say that it's changing societal values, I'll give you a simple example. The notion of privacy is one of the key notions underpinning any society, right? What we think is private or not private, what we think is taboo or not taboo, is not written down in a law book someplace mostly. It's a shared social understanding of what's supposed to be kept private and not kept private. And we sort of talk that in, a, in, in some way or the other growing up, right? So one of the things that's happening is that the notion of privacy is very different from people born after 1990 and people born before 1990 simply because they're growing up in a world where it's very easy to share. We grew up in a world where it was much harder to share. So what's private to them, what's private to us is not necessarily what's private to them any longer. That's, that's one. And that's just one value, there are others. I think we've spent a lot of time talking about this, but lots of people have made the real point that social is changing attitude towards brands. So I'm not going to spend time on this, but, but it, this is a fact. We know that. That's why we're here. Um, and it's changing consumer behavior, right? So one of the interesting ones that, keep, that I keep hearing is marketers love to fit people into silos because then they become very addressable. So if you can get an age group and you can get some sort of psychographic and you can get some sort of location, you're fine. And that doesn't work. Um, what we try to address nowadays are states of mind. So if I can find somebody who is in a particular state of mind, can I, give him mess can I message him or talk to him or hear what he has to say and respond in some way or the other and achieve something? So I think the primary change in consumer behavior boils down to the fact that you can't put people into silos any longer. There is no one silo that they belong to. Uh, youth, old, young, there are, there are large enough audiences for each kind of state of mind, each of those. Uh, and we can come up with states of mind together. But people who are interested in giving, people who are interested in volunteering, people who, who care about technology, there is no age group associated with that necessarily. Participation. Uh, again, lots of people talking about this. I'm not going to belabor this point, but of course we know it's about conversations, it's about collaboration, and it's about co-creation, which is the next slide. Uh, if you look at it from the perspective of an organization, it doesn't matter whether you're a non-profit or a for-profit, but there is one tiny little problem. The tiny little problem is that younger people joining the organization nowadays have very little respect for hierarchy. So what happens is that they don't have the patience necessarily to wait for people to ask them to contribute. They are almost biting at the pit to contribute and they start to disengage from an organization when they don't see opportunities to collaborate, contribute, etc. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's, it's not an easily solvable challenge because you have managers who are typically a lot older who don't necessarily want younger people to be talking at every or event, organization, meeting, etc. So uh, collaboration, co-creation are hard things to achieve. They're not simple things to achieve. 
there are hard things to achieve because there are real differences within people on how to manage this. And social is about integration. So, you know, you see what? You need to integrate into technology platforms, you need to integrate into marketing programs, into uh, your processes, and we've spoken quite a bit about that last few days. So I'm not going to spend some time. I will spend some time on this. This is an interesting little thing that we did. Uh, we spoke to now 2,000 plus, but this slide is a little old. 1,500 plus marketing and communication professionals in Asia, right? And we kept asking them, you know, how, you know, what do you do on social? What do you do online, right? And we found that almost everybody could be mapped into these six stages. Number one. The other thing we found is that they all went through those six stages. None of them could skip a stage, right? So stage one is some sort of campaign microsite. Right? So you take out an ad, and this used to happen a lot four or five years ago. You take out an ad and you sort of create a little microsite for that ad. You'll, you'll still have campaign microsites coming up on a regular basis. Everybody does it. There's nobody who doesn't do it. Do it. But this is typically the first thing that people look to do online. The second thing is that they create a Facebook fan page or a Twitter account of some sort. Some social media outpost they go and they create an account. And then they realize that nobody's following them or that they don't have enough people out there. 96% uh, of brand pages, it's one statistic that I found someplace, I think Seth Kogan or someone. 96% of brand pages on Facebook have less than 10,000 people following. Right? <laughs> so if that's the case, what do you do? So they all go to stage three is where they create some sort of contest or app. So they're all giving away iPhones and iPads and what have you. And that's fine. It's a good thing to do. I'm not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing, but that's pretty much what everybody does in stage one, two, and three. It's stage four, five, and six where things start to get interesting. So the first thing that people start to do is integrate social into our own platforms, so your own website. Levi's, if you go to the Levi's website and you look at clothes out there, you'll see which friends of yours have liked those clothes, right? Um, there is a game called Karma Kingdom where if you go and you decide to play the game and you can sort of buy stuff and money will come directly to an Akshapatra or somebody else, right? I don't think Akshapatra participates, but that's the objective of that game. The point is the moment you start to integrate at a technical level, it starts to get very interesting. Uh, whether it's content aggregation or what have you, but it's, you will do that on your own platforms first. The second, stage five is when you start to integrate social into marketing programs. Now, how many of you guys saw the Lay's chips ad which asked people to come up with their own flavor? Remember that one? I thought that was a great ad. Uh, most of us remember it. Do you remember the ad that Blaze came out before that? Anybody? Or after that? Must be some dancing thing with Saif Ali Khan. One person. The power of uh, creating an ad which asks a question rather than which gives a statement is evident in your response in this room. The response is the same every time I ask a question. It doesn't change. The fundamental difference is not that they're asking questions. The fundamental difference is actually that there is a shift in the way that communication gets designed. The shift is, almost all advertisers are taught from a very early age to say boom, right, with an exclamation mark after that, to grab attention in some way or the other. Uh, but online, if you, if you want to be conversational, then you actually have to be more journalistic. And by that, I mean present all sides of the story, uh, perhaps not give a conclusion, perhaps leave it open to interpretation, perhaps allow people to contribute back in some way or the other, be willing to put up with letters which accuse you of being terrible, biased, prejudiced, etc., etc., etc. And to make that shift from one kind of communication to the other is extremely hard, especially for someone who's been, you know, who's done it for his entire life. For them to make that shift, it's not going to happen overnight. Stage six is when you start to integrate social into your processes. And uh, Dell does this really well. I don't know if you've seen Dell Idea Storm. How many people have seen Idea Storm? Great, so I'm going to show an idea song video. Uh, uh, how many of you have seen uh, Dell's employee song? Again, maybe one or two. So I'll show a video. Uh, if there were more, I wouldn't have shown those videos. But what they're doing out there is they're saying, how can I make my various aspects of my business more social? Perhaps my customer service, perhaps my innovation processes. Is there something that I can do which allow, let me, especially on the support front, the people who use Dell computers all the time, they figure out how to fix things, right? So if I ask a question, I don't have to go through an IDR and ask, like, you know, then have a customer support guy who will go through a complete script before he gets to the answer. I could simply ask the question someplace and they'll give a response. Let me tell you exactly what they're doing. 
So 24-7, they listen anytime anybody complains or says something about Dell, they know. They raise a support ticket right then and there. And your response, somebody in Dell is going to respond to you where you ask the question. It could be on an obscure forum someplace, right? That's stage six because they've created a process of customer support where social ties in. It's very hard to do. So they started to ask customers ideas on, uh, you know, tell us what you want implemented. I've had back keyboards on, on, on Apple computers for a really long time. This is another, this is again, they does a lot of this because they, they made a commitment to doing this. But the simple point is that when you start anything that's social, it's not about marketing. The marketing benefit is just one of the things that you could possibly do. Being social is a mindset, right? Which requires you to evolve, both you and your organization, to be collaborative and to cooperate, right? And that brings me to APIs, which is a brave new world. Let me show you what's going on. All of you, how many, how many of you in here know what an API is? So better smattering than normal. And how many of you have used, of those of you who know, how many of you have used an API of some sort or the other? Excellent. How many of you have used a Facebook plugin on your blog or on your website? So every one of you who raised your hand has used an API, right? How many of you have used a Twitter feed plugin on your blog or website? How many of you have embedded a map, a Google map someplace? Okay. All of you guys who, who are doing this know what APIs are. For the rest of you, APIs are application programming interfaces. Okay? And they're really exciting. Because what they allow you to do is take the take what Facebook offers and bring it to your own side. Forget about Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to show you a video of something called the open social API, which Google is working on. So today I can figure out your connections. Okay, any one of you sitting in here, if I have your Twitter handle, I can run there's a little bit of code that I can run and figure out who you connected to, what are the websites you connected to, right? And then figure out how important you are or not, what your social graph is like. Okay? So, so I'll show you that video. I didn't download it on YouTube. And I will leave these three links with you because these are three places that you can go and find out more about APIs. But what's the impact that this brave new world of APIs is having on the web needs to be understood from a marketing perspective as well. You don't live in a silo any longer. Not just in terms of people, resources, etc., but in terms of what you can achieve and what kind of campaigns you can fill. You now have the power of all of these platforms that people are building at your fingertips. It is up to you to choose how to do it. I, I have some case studies, but I don't want to go there. But the point is that think beyond the smart content that I can create by spending a lot of money. Think about how you can leverage all the content that's already out there and all the tech that's already out there and build a marketing program using that. Stuff like this gets me very excited for a simple reason. Because now I'm getting access. I now have the ability to build things which give meaningful experiences to the audiences that I'm trying to reach out to. Right? Um, okay, so how does that apply? So let me get you jump into my oversimplifications. I'm going to focus on B2B. And we'll focus on social for nonprofits. That's uh, the way I see it. What you offer if you're a business and you're reaching out to other businesses is you're trying to do two things. You're either trying to trade or you're trying to sell some sort of expertise of some sort or the other. Right? For the traders, I have nothing. For the guys who are trying to trade some sort of expertise, say that they're experts at something or the other, what you're basically saying is that you know something that they don't. Okay? So the simplest social B2B programs have to start here. Can you start telling people things that they don't know? And can you do it on a regular enough basis? That's it. That's my own simplification for social for B2B. And social for nonprofit, I think, boils down to one very simple thing, impact. Which means most nonprofits make a difference of some sort or the other in other people's lives. So the relationship that you share with an audience is going to be of two sorts. You either want to make people feel better about themselves by allowing them to donate or by allowing them to volunteer. So you need to set up donation programs and volunteer programs. And you need to they need to feel like they've made a difference. So you need to celebrate the guys who've actually donated or volunteered in some way or the other, tell their stories and use those stories 
as a method of reaching out to other people. That's a social program to not progress. I know it's an oversimplification, but it's a starting point. It's, it's, very, uh, uh, it's very easy to sort of say social doesn't work for B2B or social only works for B2C. B2C is easy because B2C you spend a lot of money and most companies in the consumer space spend a lot of money any which way establishing relationships with people with audiences. So here's, these are the two things based on what we were talking about yesterday that I thought, thought I'd share. Uh, I'm going to leave two things with you. One is uh, my colleague Gaurav Mishra, his marketing hall of fame. It's a, it's a bunch of 50 case studies. I'll share it on Twitter right now, a link to that so you can download that and check that out. The other is this deck itself, and I want to share this idea with you. I'll tell you what that number is. So when I, when I was asked to come here, the first thing I did, I went to the Akshaya Pathra website, and I saw the features have to pay 675 rupees to feed 1K. So I said, okay. Uh, so I paid 675 rupees of my car, uh, and I thought I can do that every month. Not very hard to do. Uh, I spent more than that on a meal when I go out to eat myself. Um, and if I double the, and if I adjust, so I, I'm a geek, so I sort of build a little Excel sheet and I said, let me see, so let me adjust every year for inflation and I did that and I said, okay, that's still not a lot of money. And then I said, let me double my contribution every 10 years and I, I assume that I live till around 80, between 70 and 80, have this lifespan of well grown up Indian boys nowadays. So uh, by the time I die, 4,000 kids will be benefiting every month, uh, every year. It's a simple model. Thank you. That's my transaction number for the first one. So I thought, just start, just six, six seventy-five bucks a month off your credit card. Not too much. Okay. Questions? If you have any. Before I say questions, mind as well. Hi. Uh, just name, name, please, please, everybody. Uh, Priyavrat from IBM. Uh, just wanted to touch upon the point that you raised about APIs. Uh, seems pretty cool, uh, pretty exciting, but isn't that something that uh, marketers, for that matter, even companies should be scared of? Because uh, I'll tell you what, and, and the thought behind that. Uh, let's say you consider any of those leading APIs you know, in the US, cloud, for that matter. You're actually depending on somebody else's algorithms. So there are a bunch of companies you know, using cloud for whatever you know, in the US and there's a huge trend coming up. So you're actually, as, as somebody you know, who's using a mashup of the cloud API with whatever else, is using somebody else's algorithm to determine something that you're going to do with your customers. Right? So the point is that. And recently, cloud had this cloud had this issue where they actually went ahead and changed their algorithms due to which the cloud source changed. There's a huge uproar about it. The point is, when you're using APIs and you're doing a mashup, you're actually letting go a part of the process that you could have done. For example, Twitter API you for your support. If Twitter goes down for three hours, is there a way you can you you open up a platform where you actually want to listen? It, but you're, but you're completely dependent on a third party to provide that interaction. Can so, I, can I frame your question differently? I, I, this question has been asked to me before. The, the way that the, the question works is that, can I control the entire experience myself, or can I depend, or should I depend on other people to, you know, to control, you know, to sort of manage the experience? Well, control doesn't work. Uh, it's just a rule of life. Generally. Yeah. No, I, I tell you why it doesn't work. If you want to, for example, if you want to figure out who your influencers are, you either spend six months building a program that will crawl Twitter, etc., figure out who other people are. If you have that time, great. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then perhaps expose an API to that API. The other thing I can do is go to cloud where a bunch of people have already signed up and figure out who my influencers are for a specific area. The, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a personal choice. Right? It's a decision that every marketer needs to make for himself in terms of saying, do I have the time to go to market where I can sort of, sort of spend 12 lakh rupees on a bunch of developers writing code, or should I just use stuff that's already been built? Uh, I, this not invented here mentality worked really well 20 years ago. I don't know if it works that well any longer. I think the only company where it works well is Apple. That's the only company. 
is only company. Nobody has been able to replicate what Apple does. No one. And even they use stuff from Samsung and from various other things. Anybody else? Good. If, oh, right. 